All right, today we're going to talk about space and matter. So uh, we're gonna try and, and cover all of the huge questions that we had uh, in this entire unit, and there are a lot of them. And I'll apologize up front because some of my lecture slides are a little disjointed because when I looked at this whole topic, it's really hard to wrap your head around a logical flow for this. Like I, every time I stare at it, I rearrange how I want to explain things. Because every piece is tied into like every other piece in really weird patterns and directions. And so I'm gonna try and make it as linearly smooth as I can. <laughs> but there might be a little bit that's kind of out of order in where it fits up. So we're gonna talk about a lot of really weird pieces because this whole unit compose, is composed of some very like kind of interrelated yet disjointed questions that will kind of come back on us much later in other units. So without further ado, let's talk space and matter. To start with, let's take a look at what the smallest piece of matter is. This is a question philosophers have grappled with since like forever. Um, in fact, the ancient Chinese philosophers thought that there were four main constituents, four basic elements in the universe. There was earth, fire, water, and air. And now we all know today that this is, this is not right. Um, however, this keeps making a resurgence into popularity um, because of, I don't know, people like pseudoscience, I don't know. Um, we, we, we know that these aren't the fundamental constituents of matter, but um, you can see why ancient peoples thought they were really important. They seem like the main things that are different. You've got this stuff like air, you've got this liquidy stuff, you've got this fire stuff, you've got this earth sort of rock, soil sort of stuff, okay? Um, we, we, we know this isn't correct, uh, but this goes way back, right? Like by like 1500 BC, uh, this is kind of what we were thinking. So let's kind of move forward into the future some and pick up with the very first person who really started to put together that there were two main differences. And that was Democritus, okay? He's an ancient Greek philosopher. His reasoning was that there's really two fundamental states. There's stuff and there's not stuff. <laughs> kind of a weird thought. It's more philosophy than it is anything else. But it turns out he was kind of right. And we still use the same terminology. He said there's atoms, meaning, in other words, something that's uncuttable. You can't make it smaller. That's what atomic means, fundamental. And then there's this thing called void, which means like empty. And his words for that were actually uh, vacus and uh, atomos. And you can see where, where vacus would kind of give you the idea of a vacuum. That's where the word comes from. Get it? So void, vacuum, kind of all along the same lines, right? Uh, but anyway, yeah, his picture is real creepy, isn't it? He, his, he was actually called the laughing philosopher. Uh, I don't know if he really had that like crazy, uh, scary looking grin all the time. But uh, yeah, that's, that picture does not, like it's not very flattering. <laughs> anyway, uh, Democritus. So enter the atom. Uh, I know you guys have heard about atoms. You've studied them in chemistry, probably in physics, probably in seventh and eighth grade. Um, atoms are made up of some main particles. There is the electron, which is the thing that's drawn in the picture going around in these little circles, okay? Electrons have a negative charge. There's the things in the middle called protons and neutrons. The protons with the positive and the neutrons with the neutral. I'm hoping that this is really old hat to you guys and you've seen this probably a million times, okay? Because we're gonna dig a whole lot deeper. Like, it's important to me that you kind of understand a little bit about what our modern conception is. Because this is a real basic model. I mean, I am calling it basic. It is real simple, okay? The, our, more, our more modern model of the atom has a whole lot more to it, okay? But it really is still based on the idea that there's these particulate things inside of this thing and they have charges. Why are the electrons surrounding the nucleus? because the nucleus is positively charged and the electrons are negatively charged, what do we know about opposite charges? They like each other, right? They want to get together. So positives and negatives attract, opposites attract. Okay, so that's the atom. Atoms, a whole bunch of the same type of atom, gives you an element. 
So now we're kind of back to this old word, elements, the elementals, right? We're not talking fire, earth, water, like that sort of thing. We're talking about the most basic constituents of stuff that, that has the same properties. Okay. And when I say these are the most chemically basic constituents of matter, like that word chemical is really a, an important part to this. In other words, these can't be broken down chemically into anything smaller. There's other ways to break them down into smaller stuff though. So these really aren't the most fundamental things in the universe. But in terms of chemistry, they are the most fundamental building blocks of all of chemistry. So when you study chemistry in high school, yeah, you learn about hydrogen, you learn about carbon, oxygen, right? Uh, copper, zinc, all those things. How, what makes them different? It boils down to the number of protons. The number of those little positively charged things deep in the center. That's what really determines what their characteristics are. And then we organize them in this periodic table, which is one of the most like greatest feats of modern times to come up with this table that shows you trends and what things have similar, like the Nobel gases, like what things are similar, all based on their arrangement of protons and electrons. So that's pretty cool. The question is, can we come up with something similar to this for stuff that's even more fundamental than the atom itself. And, and what is the atom made up of? What are protons, neutrons, and electrons made of? Is there stuff underneath the stuff? Okay, so we'll dive into that a little bit, but first let's talk about matter in general. So you've heard of different states of matter. Uh, well first, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Let's define matter. So when I keep saying this word matter, so th think of, the those are some big concepts there. So you are taking up space right now. And I say you're not a waste of space, you're just taking up space. These tables are taking up space. The air in this room, even though I can push it out of the way and walk through it, it's actually taking up space. So to understand what space is, you kind of have to understand what space is not. Okay, so these things are taking up space. Um, and they all have mass, right? Even I blew up a balloon over here, this balloon's full of air. It, it has mass, the air inside of it, like we could even weigh it if you wanna think about weight, uh, but it has mass, it's stuff. Now, it has different properties than some of the solid stuff like this board. So we have these different states of matter, in other words, states of atoms, if you will. We have solids, we have liquids, gases, and then plasmas some weird stuff. I think you're familiar with the first three. Pretty good. I bet this last one, maybe some of you know about, maybe some of you don't. Okay, let's kind of work our way through them. So you can kind of think of this in terms of energy, in terms of, we can even say how hot something is, even though that's not the whole story. A solid is the coldest of the things that are up here. So think of an ice cube, it's solid, it's ice. The atoms inside of the ice cube, they jiggle, they wiggle, but they're stuck in place in this kind of crystal structure. So they're all in this neat little orderly pattern, which is what a crystal is, right? What a mineral is about that. And so they're shaking. If you heat it up, if you give it energy, they'll eventually start to move so much that they slide past each other and move around, okay? If you keep heating it, give it more energy, some of them are gonna go zipping free and pop right off the surface of that water and zip into the air. They've got a lot of energy now. They're really moving around like the gas molecules inside this balloon. They're really zipping around in there and pushing against the sides of the balloon and holding it outwards because they have a lot of energy. If I keep heating it, I could make a plasma, okay? So let's, let's get into the plasma thing a little bit as we go, but I wanna just kind of divert here for just a second before we talk about plasma and all that stuff, okay? If there is stuff in the universe that has mass and takes up space, do you think there could be stuff that does not have mass and takes up space but is still stuff? There is. Let me give you an example here. There is stuff, in other words, not empty space, that, that is not matter. Energy 
is not matter, but it is, it is stuff. It's massless, and it doesn't take up any space. So there are some things we refer to them as particles, like a photon. If I point my laser pointer and turn it on, like photons shoot out of the laser pointer and hit the wall over there. They pass right through the air. They would pass right through space if I was standing on the moon and shot it at Earth, pass right through empty space, not take up any space, and not have any mass. In fact, things like sound waves, light waves, gravitational waves, which we'll talk about here in a second, all don't have mass and don't take up space. They travel through it. Okay, so this is the stuff of the universe, if you will. Okay, this is not empty space yet. We're getting to that one. Let's talk phases of matter. So there's a number of different phases of matter. These are the four most important and most common, I should say. Um, and, and just to give you a quick visual, in a solid, there's a regularly repeating pattern. It's like, crystal, like think of a crystal. They have a, they have a structure, and the atoms can't really move past each other. In a liquid, they're able to slide past. In a gas, they are completely free from each other and are zipping around and colliding. Okay. If you heat something up enough, you'll develop a plasma. So what's a plasma? A plasma is a state of matter where it's so energetic, it's so hot, that the electrons that were outside the nucleus free themselves. They divest themselves from the nucleus and swarm out and just fly around. So a plasma is kind of a C. It's, think of it like a fluid of atomic nuclei, the protons and neutrons, and all these electrons just flowing all over the place. It's actually the most common form of matter in the entire universe. It is super common. In fact, like you see it probably every day. Um, maybe you don't realize it. Like in these light bulbs here, what's that? The sun is the most common form, absolutely, which is why there's so many stars. Plasma is a very common thing. Very good. like that. Big name drop there, the sun, soul. But these lights right here, it's plasma. Up in the ceiling, my fluorescent light bulbs, you apply electricity to either end of that light bulb, and the thin gas that's in it heats up to a plasma, and it glows, and it gives off light. So it is, it is a fairly common thing. Um, don't get confused by this. I, I so oftentimes have people say, wait, is that what's in my blood? Okay, yeah, you have plasma in your blood, but it's not this kind of plasma. If, the, if this plasma was in your blood, you would not be here. Okay, if you were hot enough to have free electrons flying around and like that different kind of plasma, okay? So um, this is like physics plasma. But yeah, they are in stars, so that's the most common place that you're gonna, you're gonna see a plasma. In fact, if we, have you guys ever seen a plasma ball like this? I need to get one of these just so I can show you. They're pretty cool, you like touch it. So even lightning uh, is giving off a form of plasma when you see it shoot through the sky. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. Anyway, like we just mentioned, the star, our star, the sun, is a big giant ball of plasma. So if you add, say, rotation to a big ball of plasma, a whole bunch of gravity, and a magnetic field, you can get what's called a solar storm. So when you see these, this picture, which is an x-ray, actually, this is not how the sun looks in visible light, but in x-rays, you can see how there's these crazy prominences and ejections that come off of the surface of the sun. What's actually occurring is the magnetic field lines of the sun wrap up, and they make little bubbles and pop out, and since electrons have a negative charge, they're gonna follow this electromagnetic field, and they get scooped up along with it and flow over it. And so you get all these crazy looking storms on the sun just because it's a plasma and there's magnetism there, right, and it's rotating. So that's where solar storms come from. So anyway, plasma, right? Okay, let's delve into the atomic structure a bit deeper. Okay, uh, a lot of you guys are familiar with the atom just from chemistry, but I really want to get into the nitty gritty. Like, like, what is the atom, as much as we do know? The atom, uh, really, the center of it, the nucleus, is where all the mass is. You might have heard that before, but the amount is kind of staggering. 
electrons do have mass, but it is infinitesimally small. It's so small that in every calculation you will ever do in chemistry in high school, probably in college, you will never add in the mass of the electron because it's just too small. It won't matter. You add up the protons and neutrons to get the atomic number. Okay, you get the atomic mass. You don't worry about those electrons. How much so? It would take about 2,000 electrons to equal a single proton. That's a lot of difference right there. Like, so protons, neutrons are super massive compared to electrons, okay? Um, so anyway, almost all the mass is in the center of this thing, and it's positively charged. Let's talk about scale now. If all the mass is in the middle, what about the scale of the atom? If you were to take a hydrogen atom and blow it up by about 10 to the 12, remember hydrogen is the simplest atom there is. A hydrogen, number one on the periodic table, number one, hydrogen, number one, it's got one proton and one electron. Doesn't even have a neutron, poor little guy. One proton, one electron. It's the only atom without a neutron. And it was this big, the, the nucleus would be the size of a grape seed sitting in the middle of that football field. That means almost the entire atom is electron, electron cloud. And most of the electron cloud is just simply empty space. Okay, so like just grasp the magnitude of this. All the mass in something the size of a grape seed and the rest of that thing is the electron cloud region. And that's what an atom is. It's bizarre. Now, how do we know this? I want to tell you about a famous experiment. Ernest Rutherford came up with this experiment. It's very, very cool. He, uh, he got himself some really thin gold foil. Like, I mean, I'm talking like atoms thick. That's some pretty, because you can make gold foil really, really thin. So that's why it was gold foil. Um, it's also very, very dense. It has a large nucleus. And so that, that also helped the experiment out. So there's a lot of reason you, you use gold, not just because it's pretty. But he's got this thin gold foil, and he gets himself a radioactive source. Okay? This radioactive source shoots helium nuclei. So he basically creates helium atoms that are just the nucleus without the electrons. Now, helium is two protons, it's number two, two protons and two neutrons. Okay, so two protons, two neutrons, what charge does that have? It's positive, right? There's no electrons, it's positively charged. And he starts firing these things out of this source at this gold foil. Okay, he's not really sure what's gonna happen, but he's got a detector arranged in a little semicircle all the way around the gold foil to see like where they, they kind of end up hitting. So he's shooting this beam of alpha particles, hydrogen, helium nuclei, at the gold foil, and kind of, he's kind of surprised that almost all of them go right on through the gold foil. The gold foil doesn't reflect them at all. They just right on through. And they hit just straight trajectory against the back of this thing. So from that little piece right there, he deduces that the majority of the atom is actually empty space. In other words, you fire this heavy, alpha particle at it, and it goes right on through and hits this backstop on the backside. Now, some of the particles that he fires through kind of bounce off at an angle. They, they, get, they get kicked off at an angle. And from that piece of information, he deduces that the nucleus that is getting struck by this alpha particle must also be positively charged. He knows that this is positively charged, so he deduces that the center of whatever those things are in there is also positively charged. And he's able to do some calculations to show the angle to figure out like just how big this thing is and, and what kind of a charge it has based on how those are deflected. There's like a lot of math that goes on here. Um, we're oversimplifying. Okay. Uh, and the last bit right there is that occasionally, some of these things don't just get deflected or go through, they bounce like straight back. And from that, he deduces that all the mass must be in the center. Like, because he's figuring out basically like Newtonian dynamics here. You got this much mass, it hits something, it comes back, how much mass was the thing that he hit? Like, how's, what's, how's the velocity change? Like, all those things he's looking at. Um, and he says to himself, this is a famous quote, he says, it was as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper, and occasionally it came back and hit you. 
Like, that's what, he's like, how in the world? It's like really kind of crazy. Um, so he develops this model of the atom, known as the Rutherford model, where you've got this hard, dense nucleus that's positive, and then this mostly empty space around it where the electrons are. Oh, some weird stuff going on here, right? Like, you should wonder about some things. Like, for instance, if, if most matter, like I'm matter, this table's matter, right? That table's matter. Most matter is just totally empty space. Like, literally, why when I lean on this table don't I go through it? If I jump off the building, why do I hit the ground and go splat? Why don't I just fall right through the earth? It's all empty space. Like, what's preventing it? Do you know, Gracie? What's the question? Yes and no. So quantum mechanically speaking, if we're talking about particles, there is that chance that a particle could just disappear and reappear and go right through something. Um, but as far as you're concerned, the chances are so astronomical because you're made up of so many particles that there's just no possible way. Like, even though the probability is there, it's just never, ever, ever going to happen. So, like, yes and no, <laughs> I guess. Um, but back to my thing about the table. Why don't I just fall through? It really boils down to those atoms themselves. What charge do the electrons have? They're negative, right? My electrons in my hand have a negative charge on the outside. What charge do the electrons on the outside of the atoms in the table have? Negative charge. Negative charges that are the same are going to repel. So that's why you go splat. Because you repel. So like you get closer and closer to touching, and essentially the electrons don't let you get any closer. You, the force repels you, and that's why you splat, or that's why you don't go through the table. Isn't that strange? But it is really mostly empty space as determined by Rutherford. That's really what's, what's there. So can you go smaller than a proton, a neutron, an electron? Is there anything smaller than that? Yes, absolutely. Some of you guys know. So the next step down from there is something called a quark. Physicists are some quirky people. And they come up with some really weird names. Um, so we're left with something called a quark. And turns out that protons and neutrons are actually composed of three quarks each. Um, the electron is really the only elementary particle inside of an atom. The, you could almost think of, it, it is like a single solitary thing. There's no quarks that make up an electron. But the proton and neutron each have three quarks. Um, if I remember right, yeah, you have um, a proton actually has two up quarks and a down quark, and a, and a neutron has two down quarks and an up quark. <laughs> we'll talk about that here in a second. So uh, the last thing I want to mention here, because we're going to come back to it, well, I guess two things, is that if you take a neutron out of an atom, like pull it out, it only survives for a few minutes outside of the atom before it decays. Okay, It's going it's gonna, it's gonna to decay and turn into three separate things. And I've got a picture of it here. A neutron will decay into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. We haven't talked about the antineutrino yet, but kind of grasp the fact that you could run this backwards and you could make a neutron. It really wouldn't be too hard. You take some energy and you slam an electron into a proton with enough energy, pow, you got a neutron. So as you decompose this stuff, you get different stuff out of it. What happens to that antineutrino? It's immediately going to meet a real neutrino, and they're annihilating into energy. It's going to become a gamma, gamma wave. It becomes some gamma energy almost instantaneously. They don't stick around long, fractions of a millisecond. Okay? But the electron and the proton are going to go zipping off. Okay? So you can go in reverse as well. Okay? So. Uh, the other piece to this 
is that protons, if you take them out of the nucleus, if you just have a single proton, we have never, ever, ever seen one decay. And there is a humongous question in physics right now as to whether or not a proton can actually come apart. We know what it's made up of, but can it naturally decay? We can break them apart, but can it naturally come apart and decay on its own? And if it can, that has immense ramifications about the fate of the universe and which theory that describes the entire universe is actually correct. If it can't, it means something totally different. So there's a lot of work going on right now trying to figure out, and it sounds kind of silly, whether or not a proton can ever actually decay. We'll come back to that one. I want to show you this first. This is, this is both beloved and hated by physicists. This is called the standard model of particle physics. So if there was a periodic table of the stuff that's smaller than atoms, this is it. Okay. The problem is that, well, it's got problems. There's things that don't quite work well. There's particles that don't quite fit. There's some, there's some holes in it that we, we can't quite sort out. But it is our absolute best description of reality right now. So it might be right and just need a little tweaking. It might be completely wrong and need a whole lot of reworking. Okay. And I don't expect you guys to remember all these, this sea of particles right here, but this is, this is quite an accomplishment that we were able to create this diagram right here out of the mess that we started with back in the 70s and, and 80s and things. It's like, dude, we've got this now. So it's a huge accomplishment, as much as some physicists think it's terrible. So I want to point out a couple of trends, okay? The first one is everything on the left. The quarks, the leptons, the purple, the green here, they're not really purple and green. Those things are called fermions, okay? All of this stuff that makes up matter, that we call matter, like the table and you, plasma, uh, solids, liquids, gases, all this stuff is a fermion. It's made up of these, or it is these, okay? So, like I said before, the electron really is an elementary particle. Like, it, it is a fermion itself. But a proton is really two up quarks and a down quark. A neutron is two down quarks and an up quark put together. They're, they're pieces of these build them. And we understand that now. And then there's some other really weird stuff like charm quarks, top quarks, strange quarks, bottom quarks, physicists. Like, they had to come up with something because these are properties that are not describable. So quarks have things like flavors, even though you can't taste them. Because we, we need a way to describe these things, these weird properties that quarks have. Um, yeah, that's a whole other topic. So those are fermions. The other big group up here is called a boson. Okay, So the bosons are the force carriers. Remember how we talked about there's stuff, and some of the stuff is matter, and some of the stuff is like energy? Well, this is the stuff that carries the forces. So, for instance, the photon is the carrier particle for the electromagnetic force. Electricity, magnetism, it's all photons, light. Okay, doesn't have mass, doesn't take up space, but it carries energy, and boy, if you get hit with a powerful laser beam, you're gonna know it, okay? The most recent one, the most famous one right now is the Higgs particle which has been recently discovered. The standard model predicted it. We, knew, we thought it had to be there. It didn't have to be, and finally they discovered it. We'll talk more about that guy here in a second. Um, gluons, very interesting. Gluons are actually the force carrier that holds together the up and down quarks to make the proton or the neutron. So like these things are kind of holding everything together and carrying energy, and the other stuff is the matter stuff itself. Okay. I know it's a lot. There's a lot of words up there. It's kind of probably scary. Um, people spend their whole lives trying to understand it. But uh, it's enough that you at least got a taste because we're going to mention those words again later on. So let's talk Higgs. Uh, H Higgs is a man, first of all, a physicist, and he postulated that this thing existed and that this thing, this, this particle, this Higgs boson, would be the force carrier for gravity itself, but for gravity, for, for mass, okay? So mass would be carried, would be given to something because of this 
particle. Okay, so it was kind of a big deal. Uh, so how does it work out? Well, what we think is that after the Big Bang, the Higgs field itself was probably near zero. And as things cooled off, the Higgs field got stronger and stronger, and eventually things started to acquire mass. Mass is pretty important because without mass, you don't have stars. Without stars, you don't have elements. Without elements and mass, you don't have people. So mass is kind of important here. Um, this, was, this was not confirmed until, until 2012. So this is real recent stuff. And since then, CERN has found, um, has confirmed more Higgs particles. We found more than just the one instance, OK? Um, so have you guys heard? When this first was happening, did you guys hear it called the God particle? Have you ever heard that? No. It's, it's, it's kind of an infamous story in, in physics. Um, so uh, it got this nickname, the God particle, uh, in the general media. Most scientists really don't like that terminology because it really has nothing to do with a god or goddesses or anything like that. It doesn't even, it's not even really celestial in any way. It's just the the force mediator for mass. So like, there's not really a correlation there. But I looked up the history because it's kind of interesting. So it happened because this guy who was uh, the director at Fermilab, which is one of the big particle accelerators, wrote a book. And he had a title in mind for this book. And the, the editor didn't like it. It's like, nobody is going to buy this book if you call it that. And so they changed the title of the book to read the God particle. If the universe is the answer, what's the question? That was the title of this book. Okay, It was all about the Higgs boson, is what it was about. And uh, so this whole idea of a God particle kind of stuck, and people picked up on it, and they kept calling it the God particle. What he really wanted to name his book, title his book, was the goddamn particle. <laughs> if the universe is the answer, what is the question? And the reason he wanted to name it that is because this thing is so hard to find. Like, people had been struggling for years to try and, try and detect the Higgs particle. Like, people thought it should be there, but they weren't sure, right? So its, it's discovery was a huge, like, boost to the standard theory of particle physics there, the standard model. Um, so it was, it was a big deal to find this thing, like, a huge deal. But it's got nothing to do with God in any sort of fashion at all. Um, Higgs himself was actually an atheist, and he really didn't like the whole idea of calling it that. But um, irregardless, most, most scientists kind of think it was a really kind of a bad, a bad name, and it just all came down to an editor who was like, I just don't like the title of that book. Nobody's going to buy it if you name it that. So that's how we ended up with the God Particle. But anyway, um, I guess, whatever. We also have the Big Bang, which is really a misnaming too. Nobody really likes that either. <laughs> we'll talk about that one later on. So like I said, guys, one of the big questions that we have right now is how long do protons live? Are they eternal? Do they ever decay? And answering that question is really going to let us sort out which theory, which grand unified theory, pulls together all of physics and describes our universe. It's a huge one. And I'm not sure we'll answer it or not. We might. Okay. Part of this is that the standard model assumes that protons never decay, which is one of the problems with the standard model, that beautiful little model of all the particles I showed you. Because most physicists think that can't, think that can't be true. Even though the standard model is really beautiful, it's got all the particles lined out in a nice little table, uh, this assumption that protons never decay is probably wrong. Now, if they do decay, our best estimates right now think that it would take somewhere on the order of about 10 to the 34 years for a single proton to decay. How old is the universe? About 1.38 times 10 to the 10. The universe isn't old enough for very many of these particles to have decayed. Right? They should, the universe is a big place, though. And since this is all probability, we ought to be able to get lucky occasionally and catch one in the act but it is going to be the ultimate in luck to pull this off. So right now, we are searching for this. And the Japanese Super Kamiokande neutrino detector is looking for these, among other, pro other things that it's doing. Um, and this is just a really cool detector. It's unlike other 
um, particle, it's not a particle accelerator, although they do shoot particles at it. Um, it's buried underneath the ground in Japan, and there's all these like hand-blown glass detectors in it. It's huge, it's filled up with this like super clean purified liquid. And when the particles come in, the neutrinos, if they hit the material, sometimes they'll decay into a bunch of light and the detectors can pick it up. Um, so I wanna show you guys a quick little video of this, because um, it is just really neat, and I want you to see what these things look like. Um, it's, the link is there, though, if you want to watch it at home. And we'll just pause here for a sec. So, like, we've been looking for proton decay since 1983. And we have yet to see a proton decay. Um, if, if they do decay, it's going to be huge. It'd be major ramifications. Um, but we're, it's going to take more work and more study to try and figure it out. And the Super Kamiokande is probably where it's going to happen if it's going to happen anywhere. Um, Irregardless, like these things already we know that if they do decay, take so long to decay that protons in our universe are going to outlast every star, every planet, every anything in our universe, even the stars that are not yet born yet, they're going to outlast all of those. So protons are some pretty fantastically stable stuff. But it's kind of a good thing if you think about it because being made out of protons, I'm kind of happy that they don't decay real easy. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it would be really nice to know if they do decay, because um, it will we'll be able to test some of our predictions of some of our grand unified theories. It, it's a big deal. So let's talk about Schrodinger's atomic, Schrodinger's atomic model. Um, you've probably heard of Schrodinger's cat. We'll talk about that one later on. Um, big guy in terms of um, quantum physics, right? Uh, this is our modern conception of the atom. No longer do we picture it as little planets orbiting around a nucleus that's like a star. Okay? We, we look at it in terms of what's called an electron cloud and probabilities of where an electron could be at any instance. So this kind of goes back to what you were saying, Gracie, about like, could you push your hand through a wall? Like at this level, at the quantum level, electrons literally do pop into and out of existence in different regions around the nucleus. But it's predictable, okay? Um, so what does that look like? Well, it's actually really kind of pretty. If we just take a, hydro a, a hydrogen uh, atom and, and drew out the shells where the electrons could be at any point in time, it would look something like this. So these are some of the available locations depending on how many electrons you have and how much energy they have, where in just a hydrogen atom, the electrons could be at any point in time. But it's, it's all probability. They, they could not be there. They could be on the other side of the room. But this is where they're likely to be located. And they are kind of really pretty sort of things. Now, there's very specific reasons why you can only have a certain amount of electrons in a certain area. Like, like they'll only get so close together. And we won't go over the calculations in here. If you take AP Chem, you will calculate electron orbitals. And you will figure out exactly how we know why there can only be so many electrons in certain orbitals and why they can only be so close together. Okay, but we'll talk about some of the ramifications a little bit. Um, we won't do any of the actual math. So I want to touch on this one right here because a lot of people think that this next bit is sci-fi, but reality though is that this stuff is real. Antimatter is a real thing. It really truly does exist. And we even make it in small amounts. We're not at any point ready to make like an antimatter gun or anything and disintegrate you. But uh, we, we can make antimatter in these particle accelerators. Uh, every particle on that table that I showed you in the standard model actually has its own antiparticle. And like for instance, the, the antiparticle of the electron is called the positron. In fact, it's, it's identical in every way. It has the same mass. What it has is the opposite charge. Now, what happens when matter and antimatter meet? Complete annihilation. That is not science fiction. It's for real. Like, they destroy each other in a burst of energy, usually gamma radiation. Um, but they, they annihilate each other. So any antimatter that's formed is almost immediately converted into energy because it's going to meet matter because matter is everywhere. Now, this brings into like, perspective one of the big problems right now with Big Bang Theory and in, in, in how the universe formed. And there's some sort of solutions to it. And we'll talk more about it later. 
But the big question, one of the big questions is, why is there so much matter in the universe and like no antimatter? Because our current physics models say that both the same amount of matter and antimatter should have been produced during the Big Bang. And if that's the case, they should have annihilated each other. So how is it that we're left with all this matter and no antimatter? It's a big question. It's not an easy one to, to answer. Right? There are some potential answers to that. And we'll talk about them a little bit later on. But that's a, that's a big quandary. Um, but yeah, they do, they do uh, convert into pure energy when they, when they come into contact with each other. So antimatter does exist. Okay. Um, oh, here's an interesting, another interesting tidbit. I could just go on and on about this, sorry. One of the ideas is that antimatter is just regular, old, ordinary matter moving backwards in time. Because the physics says, the math works out that if it was, if it was, if it was a, a particle, if it was, a, if it was an electron moving backwards in time, it would have the same mass and the opposite charge. If that one's true, boy, that has some real ramifications, doesn't it? Gracie, what are you going to say? Yep. Or it was, and there's a reason that it we were left with more. <laughs> this is a huge question. Yeah, you, it would destroy Earth. This is why we know, this is actually why we know there's not huge amounts of antimatter out there in space. Because we would see a big flash of light. Like, it would destroy. So, so like, we know that there's a disparity in antimatter. But there should be the same amount. But why is there more matter than antimatter? It's a humongous question. Uh-huh. Oh, when we make antimatter? No, like, if all this antimatter is out there, like, you say it's Oh, I don't think we think it's out there. I think that w one of the thoughts is that, like, like it would have had to have annihilated somehow, but how did we end up with, with more matter than antimatter? That, that's, that's the big question. And it's a huge one, and I don't have the answer to it, but there, there are some potential solutions to the problem. That people have proposed, um, <laughs> but yeah, it is a humongous quandary. Like, why more matter than antimatter? In that respect, we could all be built out of antimatter, and matter could be the rare thing. In fact, it's the only reason we call it matter is because it's here, and we just call the other stuff antimatter because it's not here. Like, there's really no difference between the two, other than the fact that if they get together, they annihilate. Like in term in terms of things, yeah, it's some weird stuff, guys. Um, and I don't have all the answers. So let's talk Einstein real briefly in his famous e equals mc squared because this has big ramifications for this as well. You might be familiar with the laws of conservation of mass and energy in that like mass cannot be, uh, mass cannot be created or destroyed, energy cannot be created or destroyed. That only holds true in chemical reactions. Turns out you, you can completely convert this stuff. And that's what Einstein's equation was, famous equation was about. It was showing the equivalency of both mass and energy. So all those particles that we talked about as force carriers and the particles that we talked about um, as being matter um, and all the energy in the known universe, you really have to add all that up because technically it's the same stuff. <laughs> I know it's kind of hard to wrap your head around that, but like the energy that came out of the Big Bang it just condensed into the matter that is us. It was originally energy. And you can convert matter back into energy as well. Okay, so that's what his famous equation was showing us was that energy equals mass 
times the square of the speed of light. But, but check that out. The speed of light is a really essential piece to not just this equation, but a lot of equations. And I know it's just a constant. And sometimes you get into the habit of thinking, well, constants are just some made up crap that we stuff into an equation to make it work right, to make the number come out right. And that's not untrue, but the fact of the matter is, the more that you study math, and the more you look at things like constants, you start to realize there's multiple ways to arrive at the same constant in different equations that are not even necessarily that related. And you start to get this feeling that a lot of mathematicians have that constants aren't just some made up thing we stuffed in there to make it fit, to make the math work. That constants are an inherent property of the universe itself. Like in a way they take on a reality for mathematicians that, that's kind of different than us looking at, it's just a way to fix an equation. Like, like there's, there's kind of a reality there for most mathematicians. Anyway, but energy mass equivalent. Same thing, they can be converted. And we'll talk more about later how they can do that. So, we just mentioned this already, but we'll say it again. Where did all this matter and energy come from? It came from the Big Bang to start with. So, all the energy, all the matter in the known universe came as the Big Bang cooled down, and then we started to form things like hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, beryllium, okay? The rest of the elements all came from stars, but the original stuff, came as the Big Bang cooled, and uh, protons were able to form, like quarks and electrons, like all those things got together and we got the elements. Okay, mostly hydrogen and helium. Okay. We'll talk more about that later on in the course. Let's get into space now. We've talked a lot about matter and energy. Let's talk about this thing called space. And when I say space, most folks immediately think outer space. The truth is though, the truth is, space is not just out there. Space is everywhere. Space is right here, okay? And I'm not talking about the air. I'm talking about all around us. We are in space, okay? It's not a vacuum here, because there's atmosphere, but we are technically in space. We are, we are, it's here, right here in front of us. Now, I know we mostly talk about outer space as the area that's like a vacuum and it's outside of us. It's a near vacuum, it's actually, it's actually got some hydrogen in it in most places, but it's small. Think about how, how rarefied the atmosphere is in space. Less than one hydrogen atom per cubic meter. Think about a cubic meter, right? Like, like one atom in there, that's not much. <laughs> There's not much in there, okay? So it technically is, it's almost a perfect vacuum. And a lot of you guys have some experience with vacuums a little bit. Know your vacuum cleaner. We'll talk about vacuums here. So. What happens if you're exposed to space? What happens if you just decide to open the airlock and somebody pushes you out and you don't got a space suit on? You're gonna freeze to death. You're gonna turn into a bird and fly away. What, what, what's gonna happen? Actually, what's gonna happen is that you're not going to freeze, at least right away. Most folks think you're gonna freeze. And the temperature is negative 455 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is stinking cold but you aren't gonna freeze right away. The reality is you're not even gonna feel cold because the reason you feel cold or warm in here is the air molecules are bumping into your body and either warming or cooling you. Or you're in some water and you feel warmer and cold or you touch a desk and you feel warm or cold. But there's no molecules up there. So your body is not gonna feel warm or cold. You would radiate your heat slowly and gradually but you wouldn't feel, like at first, you would not feel warm or cold. Isn't that weird? Well, let's look at the next thing. The next thing is probably gonna happen is that the air in your lungs, like instantaneously, is going to expand. There's no longer pressure holding it in, it's getting out. There's gonna be no holding your breath to hold that in. I'm sure your lungs would just explode if you tried to hold your breath. Like you're not gonna hold that stuff in, it's getting out. Like there's no longer pressure to hold it inside of you. Have you ever tried to take a breath through a snorkel in, its, in a pool, like all the way down to just the tip of the snorkel is barely poking out? It, you can't, like it sucks. Or how about this one, you ever taken a garden hose to the bottom of a pool and tried to breathe? I did a lot of dumb stuff as a kid. I can't even tell you. You can't. As soon as you open your mouth and put it on that garden hose, all of the air sucks right out of your lungs and you think you're dying. Like, it, because the water crushes your body and pushes the air right out. 
Like, it's really, don't do it. Like, it's, it's dangerous probably, right? Like, you think you're going to take a breath, but oh no, you're not going to take a breath. <laughs> you know, if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. That's all there is to it. No, don't do that though. It, it probably is pretty dangerous. I always tried to build my own scuba equipment and stuff when I was a kid. I did all kinds of stuff like that. But anyway, your air is getting out. Okay, the next thing is that the boiling temperature of water in our bodies is going to drop. Okay, so it's not going to have to get hot to boil the water in your body. So your skin and other tissues is going to start to swell as water vapor escapes from your body. Ooh. Okay. The next thing, and probably the most serious thing, is that the the gases in your blood, oxygen, carbon dioxide, are going to come out of solution. Just like if a diver comes up too fast that's underwater, the gases can come out of solution and cause an air embolism. Now where that happens is, is makes a big difference. If it happens in your brain, you're dead, right? Which it, more than likely is going to happen everywhere if you're in space. I would assume like every bit of oxygen and carbon dioxide is coming out of solution in your blood. You have bubbles. You're going to bubble from the inside out, okay? So even if that didn't kill you for some reason, <laughs> which I don't see how it couldn't, within about 15 seconds, there would be so little oxygen inside of your bloodstream that you would be unconscious. So I don't know. Is it a bad way to go? I, I, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's not as cold as you might think, but uh, the rest of it sounds quite awful. <laughs> but oftentimes people ask that question. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to try and answer. Um, the other question we get a lot is, could you hear any sound in space? No, definitely not. Nobody's going to hear you scream because sound has to travel through molecules. It's a wave traveling through molecules. And if there's no solid, no gas, no liquid, the sound's not going through. Now let's see if we can't show that. There we go. So I've got a balloon there um, inside the vacuum chamber. And we're going to go ahead and start the vacuum up. We're going to pull air molecules out of this container. Okay. And as the air pressure reduces, what do you think is going to happen to this balloon? It has air inside of it that can't get out. It might pop. It's quite possible. So let's go ahead and turn this on and see what happens here. Isn't that crazy? So think about like the water expanding in your body, like turning to gas, right? Coming out of your, coming out of solution in your bloodstream. There's no longer pressure to hold that stuff together. It's going to start pushing outwards against this container. Now, if we go ahead and release this, it's going to go ahead and just shrivel right back up again, isn't it? Back to its original size. Now your body probably can't do that. Let's go a little bit further with it. <laughs> that balloon's really, really handling it, isn't it? Oh, well, maybe we can't pop this one. I thought we could. <laughs> and that is really stuck on there, by the way. There's no way I'm taking that off of there. Now, it's a little crusty. But I also brought with me today. The balloon's warm. A marshmallow. What's gonna happen to a marshmallow if we put a marshmallow in there? Well, there's, a, there's gas, there's little bubbles that are trapped inside of that marshmallow, right? So let's see what happens.
<laughs> Mini marshmallow. <laughs> <laughs> right so some of that gas obviously escaped from it that when i reduced the pressure again it crunched way back down that's how they make lucky charms yeah there's there's a little leprechaun that like just kind of puts him in a vacuum chamber and then takes him out one by one <laughs> i don't think that's how they do that okay i've got a couple more for you here we're gonna try this here's some water it's a glass of water. You'll have to look pretty closely to see this water. We're gonna go ahead and increase, decrease the pressure inside of there. And if you watch very, very closely, you might see some of the, the water coming out of solution and starting to form bubbles. In other words, becoming a gas. So temperature is not the only way to form a gas. If you reduce the pressure, a gas can also form. See if we can get this down enough to do this. See the bubbles starting to form? The little bubbles are heading up to the top. If you look close, you'll see the bubbles. See the little bubbles coming up? You gotta look really close. So it's a little harder to see on water, like that. Okay. So I thought what we might try to do I've not tried this before, but I assume this is going to work pretty well. This is carbonated water. How do you carbonate water? You force gas into a solution. Just like we might do, say, by putting gas into a solution in our blood. So think about what's going on with the poor astronaut that has been ejected into space in their bloodstream, which is running throughout their entire body and contains gas dissolved in it. Let's see what's gonna happen here. Let's see if we can make this work. Oops, I went the wrong way. Hold on. There we go. Hopefully we'll get some more bubbles this time. Oh yeah, look at that, huh? So imagine your blood doing that. Yeah. So, looks like we're boiling the water, right? Same thing with the water. It really is boiling. I mean, that's what boiling is, but it's not hot. <laughs> nope, not at all. Same thing with the water that I had over there. It's not hot either. Okay, one more. It's a messy one. But it's fun. Shaving cream. We'll just do a little bit of this because this makes a big mess. Come on. There we go. Get in there. Now I've got a mess. Oh. Okay. So shaving cream has lots of air pockets in it, right? And is quite flexible stuff. Oops, wrong way. Here we go. Whoa, <laughs> it's like a snake. <laughs> I gotta turn it off before it gets down the inside the pump. Ready? It's a pretty deflated shaving cream, isn't it? Okay, I've got one more for you. Hopefully I've got a brand. There we go. Take our shaving cream off of there. And this one has to do with sound and space. I am now covered in shaving cream. Okay, 
So, oftentimes you get asked the question, can you hear yourself scream in space? Well, sound has to travel through a medium, right? And in space, there are no particles to travel through. Whether it's air or water or even a solid, that stuff's not there. I'm getting myself absolutely covered in shaving cream. This is great. Okay. So we're going to put a little bit of power up here. Okay. And we're going to turn this thing on. And what we've got here is a bell. You can tell it's a bell, right? Cover it up there. Now we're going to pull a little bit of vacuum inside the chamber that the bell is in. barely hear it. Now as the vacuum leaks back out, you're going to start to hear it more and more. I'm going to go ahead and try and, I'll try and un unhook the vacuum here and you'll hear it. pretty hard to do. <laughs> so yeah, nobody will hear you scream in space. Didn't take very much to pull much, many, much air out of here before we could no longer hear it at all. Right. So that's your, that's your example of your blood on space. That's what's going to happen if you end up out in space. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get back to our talk here. Um, some weird stuff happens when you make matter really cold. Um, and space is darn near close to absolute zero. So at absolute zero, that's kind of theoretically where, where molecular motion ceases. So think of all molecules as jiggling atoms jiggling around. As you cool them, they move slower and slower and slower. And electrons get closer and closer together until they actually pair up in some materials, and it makes some very weird properties. Now, in space, the temperature of space is at 2.73 Kelvin, which is almost absolute zero, and that is the heat that's left over from the Big Bang. And we can still measure it today out there. Everywhere we look in space, 2.73 Kelvin. It's in the microwave region of the spectrum. But, and maybe if we have some time, and I, I get my demos together, we'll show you some of this. Um, when you get material really cold, some materials become superconductive. And this is not just sci-fi. This is, this is real stuff. This is forefront technology. People are researching this right now. And you guys might live long enough to have it impact your lives. Superconductors are incredibly cool. There are some materials, if you cool them down, the electrons will pair up, and they can move through the material with zero resistance. In other words, you start an electric current, and it just keeps going and going and going forever. Right? Which means very fast computers, like ridiculously fast computers. Other weird stuff happens, too. Like, you could potentially create, for instance, elect an electromagnetic train that levitates, set it in motion, and it wouldn't slow down. It would just keep going. Like, practically no energy costs. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that is going to come out of our understanding of the nature of the universe and the nature of matter. Um, so there are other states of matter like Bose-Einstein condensates that are, are not solid liquid gas plasma. That's not the end of the story. There, there's more to it than that. Okay. 
As we move forward, we need to uh, take a look at the geometry of space. So uh, you need to understand that space is a, is a three-dimensional thing. We can define any, any location in space, whether on Earth or outside of Earth, um, by three coordinates. So what you need is a forwards, a backwards, a left, a right, and an up-down. So those three coordinates give us a three-dimensional universe, if you will. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, yeah, there's actually four dimensions handling, that's because there are. And the fourth dimension is time. So to place anything in a location in space, we need three spatial dimensions plus a time dimension because we need to know at what time it was at that three spatial dimension point in space. Um, and so that's how we think of space. Uh, kind of keep that in mind as we move forward here because we're going to talk about um, space as maybe having more than those four dimensions. Okay, uh, It's easy to understand three-dimensional, four-dimensional space, but, but adding more than that gets to be very complicated for the human brain to, to take in. So uh, let's turn now to uh, a big question that you may have never thought about, but uh, as soon as I pose it, I think it will... It will be something that you might actually wonder about, and that is, why does matter take up space? So another way to answer that, to ask this question would be to say, why can't more than one object be in the same place at the same time? Hmm. Right? This actually boils down to something that we call the Pauli exclusion principle. So Wolfgang Pauli uh, comes up with this principle uh, basically in terms of things like electrons and subatomic particles, uh, and it basically tells us that you can't have two identical fermions in the same state. That's technically how it's phrased, so I'm oversimplifying it here a little bit. But remember, fermions are those, those things that give us matter, the stuff that takes up space, the stuff that, um, has... Uh, that actually has mass. So that's what a fermion is. Uh, so things that fall into this group are things like protons, neutrons, electrons, and all of the subatomic uh, bits, the fundamental particles, sorry, that make up those subatomic particles, all those quarks that we talked about um, when we were looking at uh, the standard model there. So uh, it turns out that even if you can make something really, really cold, right, to, to kind of slow its uh, atomic motion down so that things get closer together, denser. Even if you compress it and pack it, there is, there is a fundamental limit on how close and tight you can pack some of these uh, fermions, well, all of these fermions. So uh, we can think of this in terms of some of the most extreme objects in the known universe. Uh, for instance, uh, neutron stars white dwarfs, which we'll study later on. So as you compress matter and crush it down, you get to a point where electrons will refuse to get any closer together. And because of that, it stops the collapse of a giant star, and you'll end up with something called a white dwarf, which is made up of electron degenerate matter. We'll study that later on, but essentially the electrons are refusing to get any closer. Now, if you had enough mass and could really compress something down even tighter than a white dwarf, what would happen is that the electrons would not get any closer together, right? They're the same type of fermion. They're not going to get any closer together. What they're going to do is an electron is going to fuse into a proton. It's going to combine with a proton, and when you put an electron into a proton, guess what? You get a neutron. So all the electrons will convert the protons to neutrons, and the star will collapse down to something that we call a neutron star, which will contain neutron degenerate matter, which is neutrons packed as tightly as neutrons can pack together. They just will refuse to go any closer. After that point, if you could collapse it down further, the neutrons aren't going to fuse in together because they won't go together. Uh, that's as far as you can get before you end up with this thing that we call a black hole. So uh, I guess take it uh, as you, you can only compress matter down so tightly um, because fermions just refuse to be in the same location uh, together. 
So anyway, um, that's just one of the strange uh, parts of of our universe, and that's kind of why, in a way, matter actually takes up space. Like it, it cordons off space because a fermion can have X amount of space. You can only put one in that space. Okay, so let's turn now to uh, Newton's conception of how, how space was, what space is. And we talked about this in the video that we watched, but remember, Newton comes up with this idea of gravity, um, and it's a powerful idea. He, uh, he describes how gravity operates, but he doesn't explain really what gravity is. Like, like his idea of, you know, these objects fall towards Earth at a known rate that we can calculate. Um, we use Newton's equations to send people into space to go to the moon, to go to the space station, to keep objects in orbit around our planet. Uh, his calculations work really, really well. We still use them. It's how we just got to Mars. So his calculations shown there at the bottom, uh, and it's, it, it reads the force, the force of gravity between two objects is equal to big G, which is the gravitational constant. Remember, we talked about constants a little bit. Uh, times the mass of the first one times the mass of the second one, all divided by their distance, their radius squared. The distance they are apart, the radius. So uh, this will give us the force of gravity acting between the two objects. Uh, Newton's idea was great, but remember, he thought of, of space as this empty, unchanging stage that all of this kind of played out on. So this works. It, however, is not the complete picture because as Einstein showed us, space indeed is actually flexible. And you have to couple space with time to really understand this. Remember the dimension talk that we just had? So that time dimension is inherently a property of space itself. So the spatial dimensions, the time dimension, they're all part of this thing that Einstein sort of envisioned um, two-dimensionally as a sheet that was flexible. But remember, it's more than two dimensions. Okay, there's, there, there's these four dimensions to this thing. So it helps us think of it as a sheet, but really it's not a sheet. Okay, so uh, in Einstein's views, space and time would warp and twist based on the object's mass that were in them. So this is most uh, definitely shown when you have two black holes orbiting each other. Yes, this happens. It's a very common thing to have happen in the universe. Um, we don't have any nearby, kind of thankfully, but there are cases where you have a binary black hole system. There's two orbiting each other. As they orbit around each other, what happens is space and time get dragged, and it almost creates, it does create these gravitational type waves that travel outwards at the speed of light um, from the object. So uh, we've been trying for a long time to detect a theoretical gravitational wave, and in 2015, LIGO uh, finally detected one. And we've detected numerous ones since this, this point, but this was a, a humongous moment in astrophysics was when LIGO detected the first gravitational waves traveling through space. So you're thinking to yourself, what in the heck is a gravitational wave? So a gravitational wave is, you can kind of think of it as, uh, as that ripple through space and time. So what happens when a gravitational wave like passes over you? Well, think about like a wave in the ocean, right? You're like lifted up and you're dropped back down as the wave passes, passes past you. So if gravitational waves were much shorter wavelength than they are, um, we would have like a jostling of your molecules. It would be really bad, right? As, the, as time and space warped through you, um, you could imagine some of the issues. The thing is, is that gravitational waves have a tremendously long wavelength. So it's kind of like being on the open ocean and having a tidal wave pass beneath you, like, like an actual tsunami. You're not going to know that it's there. You're hardly even going to move because the wavelength is so long. It's not till it rams into shore that you actually notice it. Um, so 
detecting these things was really, really tricky. They are super faint in terms of our detectors, uh, but they are most certainly there uh, as we know today. But we don't have to, we don't need to be afraid of a gravitational wave uh, screwing us up here on Earth. Their wavelengths are just too long. So here's a simulation of what the space around a binary uh, black hole might look like. And this is just really pretty cool. So um, watch as we kind of go around here. Oh, we're not going. There we go. So as the black holes get closer and closer together, you can see the space warping around them. Space and time are warping, so much so that there's a lensing effect and the distant stars appear to be moving. They're not really moving. Their light is getting bent as the black holes go around. Then as they merge, we have a larger black hole. So that is actually um, how we're really detecting these things, is when we have a merger of, say, two black holes or a black hole and a neutron star, uh, that'll send out some big ripples through space. And they're just big enough that we can actually detect them with our, our modern detectors. So it's a great confirmation of general relativity. It's a great confirmation of some of the particle physics that we have today. Um, it's pretty cool. Like you can literally see space and time flexing there in that simulation. So what about Einstein's flexible space time? Don't be terrified by this. I just wanted you to see um, Einstein's gravitational equation here. So you could kind of uh, just appreciate some of the parts to the equation. We're, we're going to use a little bit of Einstein's work, but we're not going to do anything like as complicated as this. So what Einstein was really saying was that the geometry of space-time affects how matter and energy move through it. So if space and time is bent, matter and energy traveling through it is not going to travel in a straight line. It's going to bend with space and time. But he also said that matter and energy are going to affect the geometry of space-time. So if you put a big mass out in space, like our sun, it is going to bend space and time around it. Um, and this is a very, very real effect. If you put a clock, because of Earth's mass, if you put a clock on the surface of our planet and put a clock in orbit around our planet, over time, the clocks will get out of sync. Because not just space is bent around the Earth, allowing the moon to keep orbiting us in like a little depression, but time itself is bent around the Earth, causing differences in the actual clocks if it goes on for a very long time. Which is why we have to keep adjusting our, our, our cell phone clocks based on the satellites that are orbiting Earth. They're going to get out of sync unless we apply relativity to them. They will completely out of sync after like a year of time. Like you couldn't use your, the clock on your phone anymore. It would be wrong, right? Because the clock up there in space is not the same as the one down here. It's because space time is literally bent pretty cool, isn't it? So let's look at his equation here. There are some, some factors in this, some variables that I think you'll recognize at this point. So on one side of Einstein's equation is the geometry of space, okay, how space-time is curved. And on the other side of this equation, uh, the, the way we have it written here, is the physics of uh, matter, telling matter how to move like, this is the distribution of matter and energy in the universe, okay? Th th these, these are like two sides of, of a coin here. Um, don't worry too much about the actual math, but I want you to appreciate the, the, some of the, the uh, variables that are in this. Lambda there is Einstein's cosmological constant. Remember, he clung to that thing in there just because he wanted uh, space not to be expanding. He wanted space to be constant. Um, this unchanging sort of a stage, but it, it really, really isn't. And his equations predict that it's either expanding or, or contracting. However, now we recognize that the cosmological constant may indeed be a value we need to apply to this equation to describe dark energy. So dark energy itself, which we talked about a little bit, is accounted for in this equation specifically by the gravitational constant which is kind of neat. So Einstein was right even when he was wrong about that. So we also have um, Einstein's gravitational constant in here, big G. Okay, that's a number that we need to apply to this. We saw the gravitational 
Newton's gravitational constant as well, right? So uh, this is all part of the equation. So, so notice how uh, I said before, in terms of math, like mathematicians start to get this feeling that the constants they're inserting into these equations kind of have a life of their own, that they're not just some method to fix the numbers to make them come out right, that there's some inherent property to the universe itself. And when you can have two different equations come up with a gravitational constant that's the same from two different directions of reasoning, that's pretty powerful. That's powerful stuff. The other things we have in here are, are some, some bits describing the geometry of space um, as well as uh, energy and momentum in space. So all those parts of the equation kind of play out to show us that space, the geometry of space changes how matter and energy move. And the matter and energy in space change the shape of space. So suffice it to say that after all this that we've talked about comes basically the realization that this thing that we refer to as empty space, it ain't empty. There is, there is something going on there. This is, this is even more than just a stage upon which everything plays out. And it turns out that if you removed every single last particle from space, it truly would not be empty. There is a sea of virtual particles that are appearing and disappearing, uh, arising and annihilating themselves at the most microscopic of scales in space. So even empty space, with every last atom removed from it, still has some energy going on. And we refer to this as vacuum energy. Makes sense, right? It's this perfect vacuum, you're a perfect vacuum. And there's this amazing energy fluctuation that's going on in empty space. Could it be that this is what's actually the dark energy we've been looking for? Could it be that this is what's actually driving the accelerated expansion of the universe? Possibly. One guy who studied this, Casimir, uh, came up with this thing called the Casimir effect. And it's pretty cool. He said if you stick two plates, two uh, metallic plates, really close together, I mean way closer together than this picture makes it actually look, that what's going to happen is that you'll exclude some of these vacuum fluctuations from the internals of those two plates, from between those two plates. Because the distance is so close that longer wavelength vacuum fluctuations won't be able to take place inside. Because you're excluding some of that vacuum pressure from the inside, and the vacuum pressure is still sitting, hitting the outsides of those two plates, it will force them together. So there'll be more pressure on the outside. Um, and suffice it to say, this has been proven. We have done this experiment for realsies, and it really does work. There is an energy in empty space that can even force plates together. So what does that mean? Well, it definitely has ramifications for what's the fate of the universe going to be and accelerated expansion and all that stuff. But it also means that what if we could tap into that energy? And, and I'm going a little bit sci-fi, a little bit futuristic here, but, but there's possibilities there that are almost unimaginable, right? There's the possibility of unlimited, free, clean energy. There's the possibility of things like time travel into the past. There's the possibility of potentially stabilizing a wormhole or even faster than light travel. Um, and like I said, that's some real sci-fi stuff there, but it's not without the realm, beyond the realm of possibility in terms of the equations that describe this stuff. So w whether it actually is something that we can do or not, like. It's possible, maybe. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of cool, uh, some of this stuff. And the more you learn about it, the more exciting uh, advances in science that are going to get. So I've been talking about dark energy here. And uh, let's just mention it again here. Uh, sometimes we refer to this as the quantum foam of space time. So that s space itself, like we said, it's not empty. There's this constant fluctuation at the quantum level. We're not talking about atoms popping into and out of existence. We're talking about what they call a quantum foam. Uh, we're talking about these really small um, fundamental, fundamental particles 
arising and disappearing. Arising and annihilating back into energy and then arising into particles again, over and over and over again. Um, this could be what's accelerating expansion, right? It would also explain the need that we have to insert Einstein's cosmological constant back into the equation. And it makes up about 68% of the known universe. When you account for all of the baryonic matter that we know about, you account for all of the regular old energy we understand, like this light from the stars and everything else out there, um, and all the particles that we can't really easily see, like neutrinos or even detect. When we add all that stuff up, it's a tiny fraction compared to dark energy. Dark energy is a major force in our universe, and we don't understand it. That's disturbing, right? So uh, if this is accelerating expansion, uh, we can look for what we call the big rip to happen in the distant future. So, like, that's going to be, uh, even at the level of atoms and things like that, will be torn apart by the accelerated expansion at some point. Electromagnetic forces, strong, weak nuclear forces won't be able to hold things together anymore. Uh, space itself is going to tear apart uh, the matter in our universe. Nobody knows if this is really going to happen, but if you follow the equations out far enough, uh, that's what it predicts. So uh, one idea of what's causing this acceleration is the fact that as space expands, you get more of it. And if the value, the strength of this dark energy doesn't dilute or decrease as you make more space, it just increases as a function of how much space there is, then you can see how that's going to accelerate, right? But that's not the only idea of what could be causing uh, dark energy or what could be causing this acceleration. Um, there's actually kind of three main takes physicists try to, try to uh, delve into this with. The first one being that dark energy is, is, like I said here, a property of empty space itself. We know these virtual particles come into and out of existence constantly. Could that be the, 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 the pressure, the vacuum pressure that's actually causing acceleration? That seems pretty likely to me, because we know it exists. It's just showing that that really is what's going on. Another idea is that dark energy itself is sort of some new dynamic fluid energy that we just have not even discovered yet. It's totally possible. The stuff that we're calling dark energy that's driving expansion, uh, maybe it's something completely unknown that we need to look in a totally different way to even find. Okay. Um, and lastly, the last idea is that maybe Einstein was, was wrong about gravity. And maybe even fitting the cosmological constant back into his equations doesn't fix it. Maybe we need an entirely new theory. Maybe that's the problem, is that we're trying to describe something with an incomplete theory. Um, or it could be any bits and pieces of all three of those ideas. You see where physicists are at with this right now, right? Um, but it is a very interesting time to be studying space and the universe. And that leaves us with the last topic that they left off with in our video, a topic that is very difficult to explain, but very intriguing. And that's that the universe may indeed be holographic. So if you think about a hologram, like on your credit card, when you tip it back and forth in the light, it, it looks three-dimensional, like this three-dimensional image pops out of it as certain parts of it kind of light up and certain parts of it dim down. It's like the little holograms kind of moving back and forth as you tip, tip it in the light. So this is, this is very difficult to explain. Um, so right now we live in this three-dimensional universe with the fourth dimension of time. What scientists are saying here is what if we are just a hologram and our three-dimensional reality is really just what's coming off of a two-dimensional boundary. Now, of course you're going to ask where the heck is this boundary, and physicists have asked that as well. Um, I don't think that anybody really thinks that there's this sort of surrounding thing that is like giving off this hologram around our universe, because as far as we can tell, the universe truly is infinite. So where would it be? 
I think that more so we think of like this thing that we call space time, this 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 property that's out there in the universe. Maybe we're trying to interpret it as four dimensional or three dimensional, but really it's it's a two dimensional sheet. And our experience of it as three dimensional um, is just just that. It's just our, our experience of it. Um, in reality, if you look at it from that light, like really, uh, whether it's experienced two dimensionally or three dimensional, dimensionally, four dimensionally, it, does it really matter? I suppose. Like like if they're if they're both two ways of perceiving the universe. I mean, it is one more correct than the other? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> it's a very difficult uh, concept. Now, how did physicists come up with this idea? I mean, it, it kind of sounds like somebody was really making some stuff up here. It, it's not. So this idea came out of new advances in information theory. So in our understanding of entropy, which is a, a whole lecture in and of itself to try and explain this. But basically what we're starting to discover is that the physical world itself may be, it may be better to think of it more as made up of information rather than a made up of energy and matter. In other words, like the energy and matter are really kind of incidental. They're not really that important to the whole picture. And what's important is information and information storage and how much information it takes to describe the entire universe. So what they've found studying black holes is that the information that falls into a black hole, we think of it as disappearing forever and ever and ever, right? But in reality, the information that falls into a black hole, like the information to, say, construct a person that fell into the black hole, it doesn't disappear it kind of gets smeared out on the surface on the event horizon of the black hole. So looking at black holes, scientists were able to discover that you could kind of calculate how much information was inside of a black hole that we can't see based on the area of the surface of the sphere of the event horizon. Um, sounds like kind of technical, but if you keep extrapolating outwards with this idea, you kind of start to come to the conclusion that maybe the entire universe itself is more about information storage and capacity, and maybe there's a way to describe that, um, and that way may be a two-dimensional universe. And then this whole 3D thing that we experience is really just an emanation from the fact that there's a certain surface area that contains all that information. Whew. That is my best attempt to explain that, guys. It is really tough. We, we maybe will watch some more videos over that in the future, um, but the concept of a holographic universe, it's a toughie, right? It's a real tough concept, but still very exciting stuff. Okay, good. I'm glad we finished that up today. Um, you guys should be able to submit your quizzes, and we're done.